we do a mic check, please? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America. The DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. everybody welcome back to the ducks unlimited podcast it's your host katie burke and today on the podcast i have cooper rossner here with me uh with from gaia and dieter he's also a carver welcome to the show hi katie welcome to the eastern shore yeah i'm excited to be here yeah we're here in st michael's at um Guy and Dieter's second gun auction, yep. correct? Second. Yep. And I've never been out here. I mean, I've never, I've been, I lived in Philadelphia, but I've never been to this part. I say welcome to the Eastern Shore like I'm from here. I'm not. Where are you from? <laughs> well, my wife and I moved here almost three years ago from Cape May, New Jersey. Okay. Um, grew up there. She was in the Coast Guard. We met there. She's from Virginia Beach and... Here we are. Here you are. Yeah. So you're kind of in between. Yeah, in between two families. It's yeah, nice. That's yeah, that's not too bad. So did you move here? Because, when did you start with Guyette and Dieter? Same time. Same time. Just a little under three then. years ago. So I was teaching high school. Okay. COVID made that not so fun. John wanted someone to come sell decoys because Zach Cody was graduating out of that uh, weekly manager position into a partnership position. And we joke around that I was the only one dumb enough to do it, but <laughs> <laughs> I got I, I came here actually George Strunk, a, yeah. a mentor and a real good friend of mine, I, probably one of my best friends. Um, he recommended me to John, and okay, wow, well, John so and I connected. I have been to George's house. Have you? Yes, yeah. and I, when we're done with this, I have to show you a picture of my my little girl who just she's turning seven on Wednesday. Oh wow! Um, I have a picture of her in his shop with holding like two giant uh, your eyes like. They're not yardsticks. They're much longer than rulers. Like she's oh, in his yeah. shop. <laughs> playing yeah, I spent a lot of time in that shop with him. Yeah. I got to go early when I started with Ducks Limited and I need to go back. He did. A, he was in a Carver's exhibit out there with Cameron and Marty. He and, did. Yeah. He did an early show with me. Um, one of my first like borrowed exhibits that I planned. Um, it was him and Cameron and Marty. Yeah. yeah and three, I love George. Three good guys that have an yeah. exhibit. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit more or a little before that. So you grew up in Cape May. Did you grow up waterfowl hunting? How did you get into carving and waterfowl? I went to a really cool high school, Cape May County Technical High School. My technical or vocational class was natural sciences. That was really a class on how to fish and hunt. Oh, really? I grew up fishing with my dad. My dad hunted, had four boys, and the youngest of four boys just got sort of busy with work and everything. Hunting got pushed to the back burner. Jamie Hand, another legendary Mm -hmm. decoy carver, came to that class and did a demonstration. And I'm watching him chop out a goose decoy. And I said, I, I want to do that. So I carved a few decoys. And then I said, I guess I got to go use them. Yeah. So then I got my hunting license. Um, I guess I was 16. So I was not raised in this. Um, okay. As soon as I started, my dad fired up and starts with me again. And um, So he, you did have someone to kind of show you. He helped out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you were just for out sure. There. <laughs> yeah. And my whole, uh, my whole friends group sort of switched from strictly surfers and skateboarders to Surfer, skateboarders, and now all duck hunters in my school. So I had a really mixed friend group. It was, yeah. it was fun. So are you hunting public land mostly? All public marshes. Okay. New Jersey, I, I I shouldn't let out our secret, but um, New Jersey has a ton of public land. Okay. It's it's really a sportsman's paradise. It's, you can hunt. I joke around Cape May County. You can throw a dart at a map of Cape May County, wherever it lands. You can probably hunt. Okay. So I started doing that. But then I actually, I, I might be jumping the gun here, but I kind of... I didn't fall out of love with duck hunting by any means. I still love it, but I found a different obsession, yeah. which was uh, up on game bird hunting. Okay. So yeah. end up with a dog, double barrel shotgun, shooting woodcock on public land in Cape May County as well. And I'm still Yeah, it's okay. Obsessed. You can have more than one obsession. Yeah, I'm still, <laughs> I'm just obsessed with up on uh, birds. I feel yeah. that way about turkeys. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're a good turkey hunter. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's in my blood. I can't help it. <laughs> And, but I love the duck hunt and, you know, and the duck hunting part such a social thing. So, and it's what I do with my dad and yeah, my brother yeah. and now 
my nieces and nephews. So oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's definitely a different. It's a different. I don't know how to explain. It's hard to explain, but people know it's just kind of a different drive. Yeah. 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 The waterfowl is very social. Um, upland birds. It's kind of a mix. Yeah. I'm it's happy fun, to bring though. people on with me, but yeah. if it's just me and the dog, I'm that's the happiest I am. Yeah. yeah. It's really fun to watch. Uh, my brother has a pointer poodle now. Okay. And he takes some duck hunting, but he's not though people are gonna get really mad at me when I say he's not that good of a duck hunter, <laughs> duck dog. But he's a he's really fun to watch yeah. uh in the field. Yeah. So and they're uh, fun to watch. It's a it's a poodle weird, pointer. Poodle pointer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. That, yeah. They, they're wiry and yes. yeah. <laughs> chocolate. They're great. I have a friend in Jersey that has a couple of them and yeah. they're great dogs. But yeah. they're fun to watch. Like that's, I would see like, we just don't have the Upland game yeah. anymore. I mean, historically we used to have quail and now in Mississippi, yeah. we don't have anything. Like everywhere. Yeah. yeah so it's, um, we don't really have the opportunity, but they yeah. are fun to, like I can see with a dog getting addicted to it because they really dogs out there the the bell stops I, I mean now you know i have a gps thing tells me he's on point uh, 110 yards away or, and then just the suspense of getting to the dog and he's there waiting for you like what the heck took you so long <laughs> and, and it's yeah it's yeah. a lot of fun are they quiet when they're waiting um, or do they start to get like mad at you like sometimes duck dogs do no you know my dog gets mad when you miss yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I've been with a lot of dogs that do that. I'll, yeah. um, I'll tease my dad here, but my, my dad misses uh, <laughs> like we all do. But my dad always, he gets barked at a lot yeah. by my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, yeah, because like our my brother's, he's no longer, he doesn't have this dog anymore, but he would get, he would whine and stuff yeah, when he'd miss. Yeah. yeah, he just waits. I mean, everybody, like I've moved here and trying to find spots, asking landowners and everybody's default is... Oh, son, we don't have them around here. All oh, the woodcock are gone. So I'm not going to tell a landowner that they don't know about their land, but I'm like, hey, let me try. Yeah. Because I'll go try, and without a dog, you're never going to see them. You're not going to no. find them. Yeah, you need a dog for them. Yeah, and there's enough, though, to hunt. Though, like, Because we have quail. There's We still have quail yeah. in Mississippi, but there's just... Just one covey instead of 20. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. My real roots are in birds, um, so I'm a big bird lover, and softy for them. I wouldn't kill them if I didn't think there weren't enough. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. They're everywhere. I, I shouldn't say they're everywhere. East of the Mississippi, you're going to find them. Um, where I, I, I shouldn't say this, but Cape May, they're in your driveway. When you oh, get yeah. up, when you get up to go to work in the morning, there there's woodcock. Yeah, if they're in there's your driveway, yeah. there's a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's a different thing. But okay, so I want to go back to when you met Jamie. And so Cause that's, and I don't think we've talked about him on here, but he tends to do a lot. He did a lot of educational stuff. Does he? Is he still, is he still with us? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm making oh. sure I say that. But he, he ain't going anywhere. But yeah. he does he still do the educational stuff like he did? Jamie is one of. He's first of all, he's one of my heroes. He's one of the most important people in decoys to ever exist. I think he has taught. I'm sure he's taught close to 100 people how to carve. Now, now, maybe not all of them are still carving. Right. But all of them know and love decoys now. All of them know and love waterfowl. Because of Jamie, I you know, I, I actually, because of Jamie, served as co-chairman for Cape May County DU chapter at one point. Because of him, I carved decoys for uh, shorebird colonies to try, it, just the connections and everything. Because I was working for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the time when I okay. met him as well. So it's like, hey, this project needs 25 skimmers and 35 turns to try to attract shorebirds to this beach. And he'd say, well, let's make them. So we'd start making them. At, um, it's nice when someone takes an interest in you. And he just took me under his wing and taught me how to push a rail skiff and shoot sore rail birds. Introduced me to some of the people that are now still my best friend, like Jerry Talton yeah. and, uh, and George and Russ Allen. And yeah, I mean... He was a huge catalyst for my life. Yeah, yeah. you and uh, Jerry have some. Uh, Y'all have some similarities there. I was when you were Jerry's, talking with your uh, yeah. surfing and yeah. and carving. We we got a lot to talk about when we get on the phone, me and Jerry. I yeah. love that guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. yeah, that's. But the Jamie stuff is really interesting because I haven't actually. Met, I mean, besides George, you know, I feel like every time you read something about contemporary carvers. His name is brought he's up. There, yeah. He's there, and that's really interesting. And he's so generous with his time. Oh, and he and his and his wife Gwen. Um, I I was witness to their wedding. It was small, right by his wood duck pond. They we got married. Um, he learned a car from Hurley Conklin, who's 
sort of one of the transitional carvers from New Jersey between the old school and the new school. And then he was good buddies with, Har- I'm looking at a Harry Schwartz goose, snow goose right now. He was good friends with Harry Schwartz. And so then I became good friends with Harry. Uh, he's, he was just there in it, in the heart of it in New Jersey um, and still is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, a, I have a question about that. So, and I saw your decoys out there and they <laughs> definitely have a New Jersey thing to them. Oh yeah. Um, and this is just something so very far, foreign to me because like I've, I've said it at nauseum, but like where I grew up, there's just, no decoy carvers. There's not any, there's just none and never has been. But New Jersey has such a distinct style and such a heritage. At what point were you aware of that history? With Jamie. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, that was my, f- so, all right, we're coming full circle. Yeah. My, my really cool high school I went to with my really cool class, my cool teacher and all that. <laughs> Leading up to Jamie Hand's demonstration, this teacher, Hans Toft, he had us study old Gaia and Dater catalogs. Okay. And then he'd quiz us on species. Not so much maker because the old catalogs are hard to sort of follow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first exposure to decoys. I mean, we had some decorative hobbyist ones that my great uncle had made or something in our house. Um, and my dad had some waterfowl prints, and but I was never aware of this. And then Jamie came around and boom, I know about Hand chopping decoys, hollow decoys, Barnegat Bay decoys, the Bayman's paint style. Um, just learned everything, everything from him. I feel awful. I haven't mentioned Dave Billig was another really influential guy to me. He's not so involved in it as Jamie, but he um, he was the chairman for Cape May County Ducks Unlimited, and it was that week he came with Jamie to do that demonstration, and then that Friday night was the banquet, um, and I went there. I'm like you're that guy that was just chopping decoys out. And he introduced me to Jamie and the three of us carved and hunted together and everything. Um, And Dave still talked to Dave a lot. He's not carving so much anymore. He's got two little girls and he bought an awesome property in Cape May County that he does a lot of land management on. But that was my first exposure to decoys. And that that style was just natural for you to... I can't break away from it. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I can see... I mean, it's so in your heritage. Yeah, I I can't... um, I can say like, oh, this decoy, now that I'm living here, I'm really getting interested in these mid-eastern shore decoys like and the Crisfield decoys, not just the wards, but in a, a lot of Oliver Lawson and trying to bring some of that influence into my work. But I get carving and then I get painting and it just ends up a Jersey decoy again and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> they have such a sleek... Uh... Sleek and clean and I kind of blended... Um, and by no means am I this big famous carver, so I don't want to come off sounding like that. But I kind of blended what Jamie taught me carving wise with what George taught me painting wise, and so it's like a simply nicely clean carved Jersey decoy with a little bit more oil paint on it. Yeah, it's got that softness that yeah. George has to it. Yeah. yeah, he has like a very soft. Definitely, his technique can't take credit for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he is special, that George. But yeah, that's yeah. You can tell in your stuff, and I was, and it's such an interesting. You know, I actually was introduced to old decoys again where I'm from. They're just not. They're not there. And I went to grad school in Philadelphia, and um, I worked at the Seaport Museum there. Oh, and okay. Yeah. We did a lot of stuff with Tuckerton. Yeah. And that was probably the first time I really like was like, oh, what are these things? Like, yeah. I didn't know. A friend of mine just got a rail skiff from them that they were going to put into the dumpster. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'd be surprised the amount of people that want to give boats. Oh, yeah. And they're hard to store and display. And yeah, yeah, we don't have, I don't have space, but it is, oh, there's a lot of great boats out there if yeah. anyone needs one. But the Seaport Museum actually could take quite a few boats. So, Tuckered and Seaport. Yeah. yeah Seaport they've got in Philadelphia and Tuckered oh, Phil- Yeah. Well, they, yeah, they have boats too. Yeah. yeah Cause they have a wooden boat shop. Yeah. Which is rare, but Tucker and Seaport has the whole sneak box building, and yeah, they tend to take all the waterfowl yeah. stuff. Yeah, they have some cool stuff. Yeah, that's how I kind of got interested, and then and then later, of course, I came to Ducks Limited, and then I really dived into all this stuff. Were there any cool um, old Philadelphia decoys? You know, I didn't not there, um, and I didn't learn about Blair until later, and he's probably my one of my favorite old carvers because yeah. of that. Sleek, oh, so narrow. elegant. And, it's yeah. so elegant. Yeah. 
I'm amazed Philadelphia Museum of Art doesn't have a Blair or two or they should. an A.B. Vance or, yeah. Because it's such a beautiful, like, yeah, style. I don't know. And in Philadelphia. <laughs> I know. Now, where were they, honey? I guess on the Schuylkill right, somewhere. Right on the river, yeah. Yeah. Um, we were talking, actually, we were just talking about this the other day, which is so funny. Um, the Heinz Park that's right by um, the airport there. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's this huge natural area right outside of Philadelphia. It's literally right outside the Philadelphia airport. And Ducks Unlimited just... Got to do a project there. Yeah, they they call it an urban refuge. It's, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're we're working on that now. And I, when I was in Philly, I would take my dog, my golden retriever there yeah. to walk and swim. Yeah. And there would be ducks and she would chase them. And yeah, and now it's a DU project. But so I guess that's where they hunt. Yeah. It's not very far. But anyway. In Jersey, we went to Philly a lot. It's funny. Uh, some of the best decoys were made there. Yeah. And guns. There's yeah. some great and guns, guns there yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but I guess just being a hub for people coming over from Europe, yeah, it probably yeah. just had a lot of makers and things yeah. like that that stopped there. A lot of influence from other places. Yeah. But yeah, in New Jersey, it has this really interesting waterfowl history that I'm sure most people from New Jersey don't no, realize. I, yeah. It's, so it's funny. Um, South Jersey's very rural, uh, has the oldest, op- longest operating Rodeo in the country, I think. Really? Cowtown Rodeo. Very rural, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of hunting and fishing, but you're at the grocery store, you sit down at the bar or something, and you tell someone, I'm a decoy maker. I collect decoys. And they're like, huh? What, did, what do you mean decoy? Here, they tell you that they collect decoys yeah. <laughs> before you even open your... Yeah. Um, everybody knows what decoy... It, it's really interesting and fun for me to live in an area like this where everybody's sort of on the same page. Yeah. They know about decoys. They know about... Goose hunting, uh, goose hunting's huge here. Um, they know about outdoors and hunting yeah. and fishing. Yeah, and that is interesting because yeah, I you're right. Like when I was in Philly, and luckily I have this nice Southern accent to go along with me telling them that I hunt. So then they were like, "Oh, okay, you're yeah. from the South." So that was like I go, but I was like far and a foreign thing to them that I would hunt, and then yeah. being a girl on top of that was just so strange. Yeah, it was an anomaly. My wife's taken up hunting, and uh, yeah. people are like, "Oh, you go to Ellis. yeah." I'm glad. That's awesome. She's like she likes it. Yeah, we actually yeah we're on the tail end of what I'm calling our late summer tour. We had the at Portsmouth auction and a family vacation and her and I just got back from a dove hunt in South Dakota and next week we're going on a sicko deer hunt in Cambridge or Dorchester County um, but we were at South Dakota hunting with uh, Joe and Donna Tonelli and Zach Cody and she had a, she had a ball it was actually my first dove hunt too because oh, really? New Jersey doesn't have a season okay. uh, there's songbirds there okay. it was a blast yeah, yeah. yeah. she had fun I'm glad it was her first sort of she had gone Woodcock hunting with me a few times, but that's no place to start. No, dove hunting is a great place to start. Yeah, they're hard to hit and you're wrapped around, wrapped up in briars and in the middle of trees and the dogs barking at you, like yeah. I said. And um, So the, the doves, that was her first time with multiple opportunities and she she was hitting them and Yeah, that's fun. a great, yeah. yeah, that's, we always, you know, we hunt with, my kids now hunt, uh, well, my older one does and I mean, not very well, but Dove hunting is the one thing I, I let her do now. It's it's, um, it was so fun. You can miss a lot. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and you're, you're still shooting. Yeah, it's so fun. The only problem was it was insufferably hot. Yeah, that's, that's 107 the degrees the one day. Yeah. Well, you got to have a beer while you're doing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> we were, we went swimming every day after. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> no, that's really great. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. We need more women hunting. I want to go back to, I kind of have some questions about contemporary carving and the community with that. Because it's really, you've kind of come up in a different group. So I think New Jersey is unique in that the community has stayed such a connected community, right? Yeah. Whereas I feel like North Carolina has done that too. It's like these two little niches that have, and then you have people like Marty in Wisconsin by himself. And then um, Virginia, it's a little bit, it's still there, it's but there. not, yeah. it kind of ebbs and flows It comes and goes down more. there, yeah. So what do you see as someone who kind of landed in it and has been a part of it for quite a few years now, but um, what do you see that is within the New Jersey that they're doing right and that can be replicated in other places to kind of keep that going. Stubbornness. Okay. <laughs> keep keep doing it. Yeah. Even have a show, even if nobody comes. Yeah. Put it on because it's worth it for the community. This is all dependent on community. Yeah. The, the business I work for is dependent on 
you know, if, if there aren't these friendships and these events, then it's just a bunch of people on the internet that never knew each other, never will know each other. Um, so Jersey has a less now, actually. There were a few shows a year, one in North Jersey, kind of South Jersey. Yeah, there were a lot. But again, to go back to him, one guy can make a big difference. Jamie and really, I mean, his influence spreads far. And I think his influence of being an educator and a steward for this Jersey, so like this thing of ours, right? The yeah, mafia, you're, right? You're, yeah, your art form. We'll go yeah. art form. This, this, uh, this heritage that we all share um, has spread into creating more educators. So George is a, ask him a question, you'll get an answer. Um, Sean Sutton, very helpful guy. You ask Sean a question, you'll get an answer. Um, that is sort of the new culture in New Jersey and North Carolina replicates that. And I think I'm, some people might get upset if I say this, but I think Jerry sort of pioneered that. Yeah, he does. I agree. Yeah, with that. Jerry sort of, and I think that came from Jamie because Jerry got hooked up and real tight with Jamie. And then said, you know, look at this guy. He's got people over every day, carving decoys. They're having fun. They're all hunting together. And I think he took that back down south with them. Yeah, he mentions that. He talks about like wanting to um, kind of spread the the friendship and advice that he was gotten given to him to give it back yeah. to other people. Yeah. And, and that's that's why I'm chopping out yeah. ducks here. You need to keep educating people. Yeah, because yeah. he did mention, yeah, you mentioned, he did mention like it's almost changed his, co- he's kind of, there were plenty of carvers and then he came and became more open and then they in return became yeah. more open yeah. where they oh, weren't maybe before. Yeah. yeah. And they thought, oh, maybe we don't have to keep this so yeah. tight. Yeah. It sounds fizzy, but you know, being nice is contagious. It <laughs> is. It <laughs> yeah. is. It is contagious. It's very true. But yeah, New Jersey has always kept that community. And then I think it's interesting that you're do, trying to spread it here because the, again, huge heritage, still lots of carvers in this area yeah. and a community that yeah. can continue to grow. So on the note of contemporary sort of like, we try like in our catalogs to be very educational. You need to be just as educational with contemporary decoys too, because just because Tom Mattis is in Idaho, somebody might not have heard of him. Well, Tom Mattis in Idaho is a a noteworthy contemporary decoy maker. You've heard of all the guys in Jersey, but maybe you haven't heard of one in Idaho. So you got to keep educating everybody about the contemporary ones as well. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Because eventually, eventually they're the old ones. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They they keep going. Yeah, they're a great place to start for anyone. Yeah. Uh, and, a, you know, a welcome addition to a established collection already. Yeah. yeah. So my next question with that is though, okay, contemporary carvers, like, I felt like, I felt, I can't remember who we talked about this for, but you had your gunning decoys and then they kind of, carvers, they almost like went, I, I think it was Jerry actually we talked about this with. It was um, that a lot of contemporary carvers when um, the gunning decoys, carving gunning decoys became less popular, they went into more decorative stuff and then they kind of transitioned back into gunning decoys. Yeah. So, and then do you, why do you think the popularity is growing in contemporary to go back to the gunning decoys? Do you have a thought about that? Because it is starting to change. So It is, yeah. I guess the best thing I can compare it to is like in calls, though calls are not quite as time consuming. You are able to use a lathe and then go in and yeah. do the hand things. You're not, you aren't stuck to the rules yeah, yeah. as you are with decoys, yeah. you know? So they have really boomed in like contemporary call makers. And yeah, they started, there's a lot of them. Yeah. There's a lot of them. And it's starting too with, I feel like more and more starting more and more contemporary decoy makers, or at least they're becoming in the light more. Like we're starting to yeah. know about them a little bit more. And it's easier too because of social media and everything. Yeah. But I I mean, to answer your question, I think it's like everything. Nostalgia. Just, uh, I started shooting an over under 20 gauge exclusively six, seven years ago just because I thought it'd be cool. Right. <laughs> but yeah. now you couldn't get me to switch back to a semi-auto. Um, but nostalgia is what made me want to do that. Guys wearing old school camo patterns instead of um, new, you know, yeah, it's Max Four or whatever popular, they call it. Yeah. yeah, people buying restored Chevy K one hundreds or whatever. You know, the old yeah. old pickup trucks. I think it's nostalgia. So you can carve every single feather in, or you can just make a nice sleek decoy like Rolly Horner did, and it's going to work just as well. But I I can't. I'm sure everybody has their own reason. Um, I do because I just you can't get me to break from like what I learned from Jamie Hand, and um, I always have wanted to paint more because I like painting. But when I go to carve, it's pretty simple and just clean, smooth lines. And I'm looking at 
old decoy books at old decoys for pattern inspiration way more than I'm on Google looking at pictures of real ducks. Yeah. It's just part of the the root of it. Right. You know, it is. I agree with that. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned like people wearing the old camp, like the nostalgia, like it's become almost fashionable to simplify yeah. in that yeah. way. And I guess, you know, there's could be a many of thing like theorize why that is. And it might just be that it, the world's so fast paced. It's nice to simplify back. It comes, it, it stretches out of our thing here. I mean, look at like people in Brooklyn wearing Filson. Oh yeah. It's it, become huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a guy I'm working with right now. We have an exhibit um, in the museum with, he has a camo retro is what it's called. He does consign like camo consignment online. Oh wow. And he's yeah, making great money doing camo like consignment. Like buying and selling old hunting coats and yes. wow. That's his thing. Mm-hmm. Good for him. Yeah. <laughs> he found I was like it was perfect because people were looking for it. Yeah. And I mean if you go on eBay you'll find it. And he's yeah, he's doing camo consignment. Uh, the the blaze orange hat that I wear every day of the season, I bought it was probably already 20 years old. I bought from a dealer in the parking lot here at the Easton Waterfowl Festival um, and wear it. And I, at first I thought, man, that's a cool hat. But now you can't get me to take it off when Woodcock season's in. It's- <laughs> no, it's become a huge thing. And I think that has a lot to do with the popularity of, not the popularity of people becoming contemporary carvers, but them being noticed for. And obviously people like Jerry have done a good job and you as well, like of using social media um, to get out there and get yeah, people yeah. catch on. And it's, it's, it's very appealing. I mean, Cameron McIntyre does the patina as well as anybody else and on almost everything he makes. And his stuff is just so desirable. I, people want something that looks rugged, looks old. And well, there's no one like him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that does help. <laughs> and, and they're pop. I mean, a lot of guys are getting into carving and they are trying to put an old finish on decoys. Um, and I, you know, maybe you could say it's, it's the perception that like they can't afford a real old decoy. So they'll, buy a contemporary one made to look old. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's I don't know. I don't fun. know if I go down that. Yeah, I don't I, I don't, don't even I, think that's it. I don't think that's it. I think well okay, it's hard to it's it's hard to think of it's hard to put words to it, but yes, there is a big price tag to get to the right. actually old yeah. things, right? Um though you can still buy some decoys um they're not that bad, which we will get into. Yeah I was gonna say I know a place you can Yeah, I know. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into it. But I think, you know, we've been buying art for our most of our existence. Oh, yeah. And I think that there is something about knowing the person who did it, knowing why they did it, and having that connection to the original source that will be appealing no matter what. Yeah. And I think that's why contemporary... I think that's why contemporary carvers will always have customers. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't know John Blair. You can't know... Elmer Crow, but you can know you and you yeah. can know George. 99% of my personal collection are people I know. Yeah. People I'm really great friends with. Yeah. Relationship, knowing them is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And I think that has a big appeal to contemporary carvers. Yeah. Well, let's take a break. Okay. And we'll come back in. Stay tuned to the Ducks Unlimited podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, after these messages. Let's go into what you're doing with Guy and Deer a little bit, because we kind of hinted around it, and yeah. and but we just kind of have actually talked about it. But for the audience notes, I've talked about decoysforsale.com on several, I don't know, I'm, I can't even think of how many podcasts I've mentioned it. But it always comes up because one of the questions we always ask, because a lot of our listeners are not decoy collectors, but they might want to be. And I always recommend decoysforsale.com because it's such a good, safe place to start. Yeah, And yeah. you are that guy. You are decoysforsale.com. He stole the words right out of my <laughs> mouth. That's exactly what I say. It's a safe place to collect. It's seen a lot of changes. Like, for example, it's not decoysforsale.com anymore. Oh, it's no. <laughs> you go to bid.gaiaandeeter.com, and that's where we have all our auctions now. Okay. So how did you... Let's start with how did you... Get, so you told me how like you got hired, but were you hired for that position? Yes. Okay. And did it start with you or did it start with Zach? It start, oh, no. Zach 
Cody, John's partner now, yeah. started it. Okay. Started it here in Maryland and then moved with his family and brought the company with that part of the company with him up to Maine and operated it out of there for a while. It's like all things started to grow, um, got to the point where it was too much to be shuffling back and forth to Maine, I think. Yeah. So here we are in our big new warehouse building and it's all here. So I'm teaching high school to maybe third year in teaching, still sort of fresh out of college. George Strunk texted me in the, middle, in the middle of the school day and says, your name came up for a job today. I'm like, dude, I already have a job. What are you talking about? Um, it's like, call him after school. And he says, yeah, you know, Dieter was on the phone with me today. And next thing, you know, one thing led to another and called John and he tells me what they're looking for. Says, you'd have to relocate to the Eastern Shore. That's no problem. <laughs> um, you know, you'd be working full time selling decoys. That's no problem. It was sort of a no brainer. We grew it. We we were still growing it. It was it was great. It was roughly thirty items a week. Now we're sixty to eighty items a week, and I think that's sort of our sweet spot. Is it still mostly decoys, or is it? Mo- oh, nine out of ten items are decoys. Okay. Yeah, decoys. Um, my emphasis is on you know if do we the three of us, um, John, Zach, and I, do we deem this to be collectible? Would we recommend you buying this? We're not going to offer it if we wouldn't. So it's 60 to 80 collectible decoys, paintings, calls. Calls do well on there. Yeah, it's a great spot for them, especially yeah. with the price point that tends to go. It's a good yeah. place for them to be. We've sold all sorts of things on there, but it's mostly decoys. Um, yeah, and there's definitely been uh, shot shell boxes on there. Shot shell boxes, shorebird whistles, all sorts of things. I sold a guitar on there. Really? <laughs> yeah. It was part of this uh, big estate we got. We handled it. And they were like, well, you're taking the guitar too. And we were like, uh, all right. So sold the guitar. Um, it was a good guitar. It was a Taylor 310. Yeah. Did it do okay in your audience? Yeah. It had some damage. So it brought up what it was worth. Yeah. 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 I didn't know the decoy community was very into guitars. Yeah. Well, you know, like uh, like Strunk called me about it because he used to make guitars. Oh. Um, and he's a guitar player and... Sean Sutton actually is a really good guitar player as well. And I'm a really bad guitar player. <laughs> um, so it was it was fun actually to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So yeah, so you're doing 80 to 90 decoys a week. Uh, 60 to 80. 60 to yeah. 80. Okay. Yeah. And then you're gonna put more expectations on is, me. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. Um, and what is the like average price range that those are going for? Like what are what are they looking at? So that I mean the better way to say it would be when we're consigning items. Okay. We're looking for something worth roughly four fifty or more. Now, like the sort of next step to that answer is when we're deciding if it's in a live auction or going to the weekly sale. Because that's we still internally call it decoys for sale, but it's it's our weekly auctions. Um, I've sold items on there. I sold a Cameron McIntyre redhead for seventeen thousand dollars. Seventeen thousand four hundred dollars. It's been up to twenty thousand. Oh wow! Um, and it's been low as, admittedly, fifty dollars. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's a it's a call that you know is hey, this is for someone, but it's not worth a lot. Yeah, we'll offer it. Yeah, um, maybe it's missing a to read or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. What was I saying? <laughs> like, oh, like the average, your average range. But you said it was you go by like. So oh, deciding between the catalog or the yeah, weekly that's, auction. Yeah, that's what, I think like, so John and Zach, it's funny, right? We have this sort of playful attitude about it in the warehouse. They're building a catalog sale. There's the collections that we're offer, or representing. Um, there are the good decoys that can sign specifically for that auction. But then sometimes we're, we have to duke it out. And I'm like, hey, let me offer that in my next quarterly sale. And like, oh, I think it'll do better in November. It's, it's a yeah. fun thing. Um, but that cutoff's usually around two thousand, right? So if it's worth two thousand, and that's this is sort of the elevator pitch for consigners that are asking us the same question: Will this item be in the weekly sale or in catalog sale? I'm saying, well, that's right on the right on the cusp. Um, I'm going to consign it for November. If it gets bumped, it'll be in a quarterly sale, which is when I do the, the bigger two hundred two fifty lot once. Okay, so yeah, right. Okay, this is kind of a nerdy question, but I just was wondering what the difference is because, like, with Museum donations, you know, I don't want, I don't want any restrictions yeah. because then that really like puts 
uh, pressure on me to have things out all the time or uh, I can't really do an exhibit I want. So I try to take, you know, I take a gift that's no restrictions. So that way we can kind of use that object as we need to. I mean, obviously, if we're going to take it into our collection, then we have to promise that we will take care of said mm-hmm. object. So for consigning and you have these two platforms, do you have to negotiate like that you can do it, you can sell it on either or can't, or do you just, how does that work? Like, yeah. I've never thought about that. Like, would they say, oh, I only want this to be in your, like, November auction? Or would you, would they, like, or I, I definitely don't want it in the weekly, or I think it'd be fine in the weekly. Like, how does that work? Do you have to... Sometimes um, the weekly sales have gotten so strong that it doesn't... Yeah. It, it, it's it's almost... It, they're one and the same. They're on the same platform now. We have our app, our guy at Indeed, our app. All the sales are right there. It's just a matter of if we're going to put on a cocktail party or not. Really. Yeah. So basically, you're just promising them the best that you can. Like, we're going to try our best to get you the best price. We're going to represent. I mean, in a nutshell, we're a marketing company, yeah. right? We're going to market right. your item in the way that is mutually beneficial to both of us. In the best way possible is how we'll represent your item. So, there, you know, we don't really ever get into disagreements really- with consigners about it. it. This company has a really long reputation of trust and has worked closely and honestly with a lot of people. I think, and I I know, people have a lot of faith in us to do what we think is right. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, I just, when you mentioned it like that, I was like, oh, I never even thought about that they would have an opinion Now, I mean, if you, if you bring me a repainted um, Harry Shorts Black Duck, we're not going to put it on the cover of our November right. auction. Uh, yeah. Well, hopefully they would know that. But it's still a collectible that. decoy and we're going to represent it for you. Yeah. Right. And that's like the one thing I always tell people like with decoys for sale. Sorry, it's that's all. Uh, that's how I it's think still, of it. Hey, that's, but like it's a the, brand, yeah. um, the condition reports, that's what's so important because you can, Guy and Dieter, you can trust them that they have done the job. Guaranteed can, condition yes. report. And whereas like if you went on eBay or anything like that, you're kind of just So that's why guessing. I say it's a safe place to collect. Yeah. I mean, my job, my job is to describe ducks. That's, I come in in the morning and I start describing ducks and I start cataloging. I get pulled to all different, yeah. you know how it goes. I yeah. know exactly what it's <laughs> yeah. like to describe that's, ducks. That's what I do. I, <laughs> I'm here to catalog decoys. Um, we guarantee it. If you think I'm wrong, call me and let's talk about it. Yeah. And let's, uh, sure, I might, I could be wrong. I have been wrong. You're um, human. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> It's safe. There's everything is. I had to do a condition report on the guitar. Oh, <laughs> everything yeah. gets a condition report. Yeah. Every yeah. Uh, Did you have to call someone to get? No, accurate? I just. I, I, I mean, because you're not selling it for something crazy, so I guess it's. At one point, I was really interested in luthiership and okay. guitars and guitar repair, so I know a little bit about them. Yeah. Um, enough to enough to represent one out. sort yeah. of yeah. yeah yeah. No, I know. I, I have appraised things and um. Yeah, there's some things like I know enough that it's fine. I can do it. Yeah. And then there's some things like I'm like, no, I can't do that at all. Yeah. Well, uh, I I'm spoiled. If I get an item that I'm just thrown off on, I've got John and Zach. Yeah. Just text a picture to Zach. Hey, help me out with this, or text a picture to John, or um. I do that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and I have a, I have other yeah friends in the industry that yeah. you know if I'm not certain about something. I can ask. All right. So I have a question about using the weekly sales. So if you're a new collector and you are going through the weekly sales and maybe you want to start collecting and you're seeing things, but maybe you're overwhelmed because I mean, again, it's 60 to 80 decoys a week. That's a lot of decoys. Yeah. And and over and over again, people, and I think that's kind of hard advice sometimes because people always say, um, you know, collectors usually give advice that like pick especially off and stick with it. You know, pick your focus. Yeah. But that's, it's good advice. It's easier said than done, right? Like, especially when you're looking at some like weekly auctions that are 60 to 80 decoys and you may not know about all of those decoys. That's a lot to learn about. I mean, there's so many carvers and so many different styles. What would you, how would you recommend like digesting? Yeah, that's that? a great question. And it doesn't just happen online. It happens. We have people in this gallery and warehouse every day of the week. Um, it happens in person too. They come here and they see all the ducks back there and, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. I'm sure you are. Yeah. Um, so lot. do yourself a favor, come back, keep coming back. The first time you go to bid.gaia and 
If it's your first time ever on the website, I don't want you to buy anything. Don't just look. Um, come back next week. Just look. Just keep reading them. Keep reading the descriptions, the condition reports. Hit So there's a toggle up t- top right button. Hit past sales. Look at the past sales. If you know you're interested in Harry Shorts, type in Shorts and hit past and scroll through all the past ones. Our old platform, decoysforsale.com, is actually still active and we kept it active specifically for that, for people to still go use. So we still maintain that domain name because you can go to that still and there's thousands, thousands, I mean, thousands of records of sales on that. And we're our new platform's still new, so there's maybe only a couple thousand. But um, just keep visiting the site. Um, get the app. Instead of going to Instagram, go there. Not every time, you know, you can't obsess over it, but um, learn, take it slow, take it, take it painfully slow because we don't, and you know, we're a business, right? We don't want you to buy one thing, get burnt out and never come back. We want you to become a collector, not just for business because of all the things we have been talking about, community and everything, friendships. But um, we want you to do this slow and smart and don't get burnt out. And at the same time, as many times as you visit our website or our warehouse, go to some shows and meet some other carvers and some other collectors. Um, and like you said, you know, pick a region or everybody's got that one thing they want to tell you. Um, I always say, buy what you like and the best you can afford. So sort of twofold. If you like it and you can afford it, it's for you. And then, I mean, I did it. I, I bought a bunch of decoys, realized, okay, that, that, that isn't really for me. So you sell them and then you have the money to buy some other ones that you know you're going to learn. It's You need to do it for a while in order yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really good advice because that's, yeah, it is overwhelming. And like I have a coworker who is, in, he's just, he's a younger guy. He's into collecting and he goes on your website all the time. And he will ask me like, you know, he'll give me five to pick from. And I'm mm-hmm. like, well, this is what I would go with. But I'm like, but I'm not you. But yeah. yeah. And I'll like, this is what I like. It's, it's, Mind boggling to some people will have, I mean, a lot of clients, we, we tell people not to buy something a lot. A lot of clients, you know, I just had a guy texting me yesterday. He was at a show, Galena on the Eastern shore here. Um, he texted me like, what's this worth? Should I buy it? And I just text him. I don't really think that's for you. I, I said, I think it's worth X amount. Are you thinking about buying it? And he said, I don't know. Should I? And I said, no, don't buy that. And now of course I feel awful because I took a sale from a, <laughs> From a dealer, but um, yeah, I think I do think he ended up buying it anyway. Yeah, I mean, they're gonna, people are going to do what you want to yeah. do. Yeah, and that's it's true because I like in this situation it was um, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like a Mason and some other things, and it was one a, a Louisiana decoy that yeah. was a good Louisiana decoy, and um, you know, people scoff at Louisiana decoys because they're not usually in great condition. Yeah, because it's Louisiana. Yeah. And but I like Louisiana because my mom's from Louisiana. I have a connection there. I I like the folksiness. Of I like them. them. Yeah, yeah. I think they're they're real funky, and I like that about them. Um, so I was like, this is what I would pick. Like, I you, you don't have to worry about the quality quite as much. And yeah. there's a couple things that you just as being around them, I was like, but then you're not from. I mean, I yeah. don't know. It's not. It's up to you. But this is what I would pick. And, yeah. You know, and it's a good decoy, and I think you got it. But we've got people. Yeah, I mean, they'll call me up. Uh, you know. Thursday, well, it's all week, but Thursday, my phone just goes and goes and goes. People call, hey, before this thing ends tonight, you know what? Tell me about the the paint on the right speculum or something. Um, people saying, you know, what do you think of that? Should I get it? I'm like, ah, it's not for you, but you should look at this one. Or um, you'd be amazed at how often we're honest against ourselves. Or, yeah, so, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so in that, I mean, I know like with John and Zach because they go and visit yeah. a lot of the collectors. So you're still having that very like you know your your buyers collections and things like that yeah. in the same way. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It was um immediate. When I took over the weekly platform from Zach, um Zach still got a lot of rollover phone calls and everything, but it was like immediate. It was like people sending me long emails. I'd like to introduce myself. I've been buying from Zach for X amount of years. Oh, and, yeah. Um, people call me. You're the new guy. Okay, well, let me tell you about me. And, <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So, and it was great. It was really easy to form a lot of relationships in a short amount of time. Um, yeah, I never thought about that with the weekly sales, but that's really great that you get that aspect uh, of yeah. this field. And they call... I mean, my cell, uh, my direct cell phone number is plastered all over that website and all over the old one. I don't... If I don't know you, I don't care... Just text me or call me if you have a question. Um, and that that 
goes along with how someone should get started, call us, please. Um, we want to we want to talk to you. Uh, we don't want to see you waste money. We don't want to see you feel burnt. I mean, we always have our consigners' best interests in mind, but we're also very concerned with protecting our buyers. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. So okay, let's just do quick logistics because I don't think I've done this. When do the when do the new decoys come out, and when do they end? When they come out varies. We try. I I try to be on a pretty strict by Friday afternoon. They're back up. They end every Thursday, starting at seven, but then it's staggered. So the first lot ends at seven p.m. Eastern time, um, and then the next one's seven o one, seven o two. But depending on the activity, time gets added sometimes. Uh, if you bid in, the, so anybody new out there, if you bid in the last two minutes, it automatically adds two minutes. So you can't. Like eBay, you can't come on and snipe it at the last second um, because we want to protect our buyers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, if you get outbid, you deserve time to place another bid. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. No, that's great because that's really annoying sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we end, um, first I want to ask you if there's anything we haven't talked about that you want to mention. Again, just I, not to beat a dead horse, but if you're interested in getting started in this, reach out to us. If you're close to Maryland, if you're close to the Eastern Shore, come here. Um, call us. We're here nine to five, Monday to Friday. You know, if you want to get in this and be successful, communication is your strongest tool. Um, and forming these relationships with not just with us, with dealers, with call, carvers, other collectors. Um, find a mentor. I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for the guys that mentored me. Yeah, I owe it all to mentors and my parents. My parents were. They, I oh, mean, your parents. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I came home at fifteen and. Learner's permit said, we got to drive to the sawmill. I got to start carving ducks. And <laughs> my mom said, okay, but I got to start hunting. They, you know, great supporters of me. Um, but find a mentor, find someone you trust to sort of take you under their wing. Yeah. And it's a great community in that they will. Um, it's, it's easy. It's easy to find. Yeah. The most, and I don't know. As we talked about carvers, but even collectors, most of them will invite you in their home. And oh yeah, let you see their stuff. And, and it's funny. Don't don't worry you. about. Uh, I always find it funny. Uh, Pete Peterson jokes around that Cameron is his mentor. Cameron's twenty years younger, so yeah. it doesn't matter who it is. If if you like them, if you get along, if you trust them, let them teach you. Yeah, no, that's great. How do you find your your decoys? Oh, so, mine. Yes. So people can say, how would they see them? Instagram. Yep. What's your Instagram? Hint? Cooper Carves. Cooper Carves. And then, of course, the website for the... Bid.GaiaAndDeeter.com. You'll see decoys every week. If you go there right now, you won't. You'll see guns because we're getting ready to sell these guns Monday and Tuesday. I think I'm on track to get the next sale back up by Thursday morning. Okay. So it'll be a full week of them. Full week um, of them again. Do you take breaks every time you'll have a major auction? I try not to because... We got to keep selling. I, yeah. We bring in a lot of ducks and we got to keep pushing out a lot of ducks, but I I won't compete with ourselves. Right. Well, and I just say, and also, I mean, it's not the biggest operation. You have to help, obviously, with the to, live yeah, auctions. So. I have to. Um, oh, the live auctions. It's all hands Screw on me deck. up big time, but I, I have to help with the live auctions. And then I got to get right back to having a weekly one. We skipped a few when we were doing the Russ Goldberger collection over the summer because we just wanted all eyes and ears to be on that. But usually... We'll skip. Sometimes we'll skip. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I just, it depends I mean, on the dates and yeah. Like even Leanne, like all the wives are here. Yeah. So everyone's here to work on live yeah. auction. So I just know how that works. So um, yeah, that makes sense. Do you, I'm just trying to get the logistics stuff. Like, do you let people know if you're going to have a break on the website or do you just kind of like, uh, I don't know. I just don't know how it works. It's so, I mean, are, do, they do people, all reach out to me. Yes, I say, they, I was like, yeah. they probably call you if there's not one. The, if it's not up by Friday night, I am getting calls. I, some of them are really sweet about it. Are you all right? Oh, <laughs> hey, that's I, so I'm, sweet. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> well, look at these people. They want their decoys. Yeah, well, yeah. They are passionate. They are. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so thank much you. for doing yeah. this. This is really great. Yeah, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, we got to do it in person, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah, not over the phone. And, no, um, I hate doing them over the phone, but... This is much better. Yeah. So thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. All right. Well, thank you, Chris Isaac, our producer. And thanks to you, our listeners, supporting wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to the DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. 
Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit ducks.org slash DU podcast. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned.